I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Joe. Digital. Maserati, Rick, and Detroit. Deep. Convertible bird in Miami. Yo. Graduated summa cum laude. Yo. Strip club made a tsunami. Black. Carlton Hines with the ball game. Switch. Grateful Edmonds with the snowflakes. No. Craig Pettis in the M Town. Yeah. Sal Magluta with the boat game. <laughs> Falcone with the cocaine. Uh. Like Freeway Ricky with the plug game. Uh. Like Monster Cody in South Central. Uh. Larry Davis from Close uh. Range. Drug kingpin Frank Usher is back in handcuffs. He got a life sentence for murdering and beheading three people back in the 1980s. But he's been a free man ever since a successful appeal in 1994. Until now, Fox News' Ron Savage joins us live with the latest. Ron? He's one of the most notorious crime figures in Detroit history. Federal agents raided his house, and then later he saw a judge here in federal court. It's a raid in a quiet Southfield neighborhood Thursday morning at the home of Frank Lee Usher. Police once believed he may have been involved in 15 murders. He was convicted of three. Also previously convicted of aggravated assault and a felon in possession of a firearm. Usher was sent to Jackson Prison, sentenced to life for a triple murder that stunned the Motor City. In 1979, two men and a woman were shot multiple times at the Federated Democratic Club, an East Side Detroit Social Club. The bodies of the three adults were found in a van near the club. All three were beheaded and their hands cut off. Usher was one of five charged with the murders. But after serving 15 years, Frank Usher had his conviction overturned on appeal by a technicality in 1994. He was a free man again. Federal agents say that Frank Usher has been selling heroin to undercover agents. They said Usher would frequently leave his Southfield home and sell heroin with another man at this home on St. Alban at East McNichols in Detroit. A judge signed a search and arrest warrant, and Fox 2 has the only cameras rolling as ATF agents, assisted by Wayne County deputies, take Usher into custody. Hey, Frank, Ron Savage with Fox 2. Why did they raid your place today? Usher told the judge he's been retired from a restaurant position since 2002. But prosecutors say he's able to pay for a very nice place here on Webster, near Southfield and 12 Mile in Southfield. What have you been up to since you're released from prison? Have you been working? Do you have a job? Agents seized Usher's black Ford F-150 pickup. They say they saw the truck in Detroit with Usher behind the wheel supplying heroin. And while we saw the feds pick up Usher in Southfield, at the same time, agents were raiding the home on St. Aubin. Three others, also taken into custody, saw a judge on the narcotics charge as the St. Aubin heroin operation was shut down. Well, they had a raid on this house today. It looks like they're moving in to clear the neighborhood up. Good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Some living in the neighborhood said the drug house has been a real danger and a source of fear. Yeah, we they get rid of all of them. You don't want to see that in your neighborhood? No, heck no, man. Got kids around here and stuff, you know. No bond for Frank Usher, who is now 71. The U.S. attorneys requested the judge deny bond for now, giving them time to review his prior convictions to fairly address a potential bond. He'll be held in the Wayne County Jail until a possible arraignment Friday afternoon in federal court. Ron Savage, Fox 2 News. Yo, yo, yo. We back to your boy Pop a lot Mob Ties on our way to Detroit. All my niggas in the D, y'all niggas get in the comment box. We about to cover a big dog in the game. Story is circa 1970s. Actually, I want to say it starts in the 1970s and it goes all the way up to recently. And the dude we're going to be talking about going to be Frank Lee Usher, better known as Big Frank Nitty. Um, a lot of people might know him or the people that do know him probably know him from his involvement with Murder Row or Murders Row, the Detroit gang of hitmen that were connected to 15 homicides in the two year period. But what we about to talk about is pretty much some of his early exploits where he was originally convicted of a triple beheading I want to say in 1979 sentence in 1980 and was in jail 
on that conviction from 1980 to 1989 where his super lawyer Steve Fishman had the conviction overturned where they said that he was supposed to be beheaded also that day where he talked his way out of it somehow and that beheading supposedly had taken place because it was a power struggle for the lead in Murder's Row. But we ain't going to tell the whole story. I'm going to let y'all hear about it. Um, also, he was just arrested on a heroin or arrested. They say he was running a heroin rink, allegedly. So, um, yeah, this this story goes from 1970s all the way up to pretty much now. Y'all check it out. Get in the comment box. Let it be known what y'all think. It's your boy Poplot Mob Ties. The alleged crimes arose out of a series of events at the Democratic Club, a private club in Detroit, culminating in the killings of three people, their subsequent beheadings, and amputation of five of their six hands. The evidence showed that two men were wired money to travel from California to Detroit and testimony indicated that they were in the club the evening of the killings. With respect to defendant, the evidence showed that on the morning of the killings, he was allowed entrance to the private club by the doorman. The three victims arrived soon after the defendant, 121. Mitch, at 350, arrived. Orders had been given that people were not to be let into the club. After the killings, Defendant was seen at a table with the men from California while others cleaned up the blood in the club. One of the men was counting money. Muffled sounds were later heard coming from a storage room. A witness saw an amputated hand in a storage room and defendant exiting from it. A witness to the events was nervous and shaking as he told the club cook the defendant had cut off the woman's head. One defendant and the men from California left the club together. Club members then proceeded with an orderly cleanup of the club, including the disposal of guns and a meat cleaver that had not previously been on the premises. The autopsy report showed that the victim's death was caused by gunshot wounds to their backs and heads, and not as a result of their subsequent decapitations. Defendant does not contest that the deaths were due to a murder in the first degree. Instead, defendant argues that there was insufficient evidence to support the prosecution's theory that defendant aided or abetted in the murders. The evidence introduced at the preliminary examination was substantially reproduced at trial. In addition, the evidence at trial when viewed in the light most favorable to the prosecution, showed that defendant conversed with the victims at a party he had given in the early morning before the killings. The victims worked for defendant. They left the party at the same time. The victims arrived at the club soon after defendant arrived. Defendant gave his gun to the man who had obtained the services of the hitmen from California. When the hitmen arrived at the club, Defendant sought the possession of one of their guns. Defendant and the hitmen were well acquainted. 3. After the victims were repeatedly shot, their bodies were removed to the storage room, where defendant decapitated at least one of the victims, while other members of the club cleaned the building. Defendant, in a joyful mood, sat at the table with the two hitmen while they counted money. After retrieving his gun, Defendant left with the hitmen and the three of them drove away in defendant's car. The meat cleaver, which had never previously been at the club, was disposed of. Some time later, defendant was heard to say that he was considering killing three witnesses who had talked to the police, but thought the police would connect those killings to him. We find that a reasonable jury could have found defendant guilty of first-degree murder beyond a reasonable doubt.
Viewed in the light most favorable to defendant, the evidence showed that defendant was a part of an elaborate plan to murder the victims and dispose of the evidence. Defendant even tried to obtain one of the hit men's guns to participate more fully. His presence tended to facilitate the killings. The victims were lured to their deaths by the man for whom they worked. We also find no merit in defendant's claim that the verdict was against the great weight of the evidence.